This is the art of charm. Learn everything you need to know to crush it in business, love, and life. The art of charm is where ordinary guys become extraordinary men. Welcome to the Art of Charm. I'm Jordan Harbinger. If you're new to the show but you want to know more about what we teach here at the Art of Charm, listen to the Art of Charm Toolbox at the Art of Charm slash toolbox. Looking forward to meeting all you guys here at AOC. All right, I just got a great listener email from Brooke S. I won't say her last name, but she said, Hi, I just started listening to your podcast and I'm all about it. I love the idea of a show focused on self improvement to the max mastering oneself in all aspects of life to become the best person possible while making the world better one step at a time. I have one minor issue, though, that still does not settle with me as I listen to The Art of Charm. It actually almost turned me off from listening to the show completely at first, and I thought I would make a suggestion for possible consideration in the future. Throughout The Art of Charm, in the very introduction to the episodes of the podcast to basically the entire marketing campaign, Men, How to Become the Best Man is the addressed audience. I am aware that the show focuses on improving dating situations from the hetero male perspective, but even in those cases, as with the majority of other topics, concepts, and classes you offer, this school of thought is universal and applies to both male and female, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. Myself, I guess one might say feminine queer female, was even attracted to the idea of taking one of the Art of Charm courses, but because talks about it cater so much towards men and masculinity, I found myself feeling not welcome to even consider the idea. To be charming, cultured, and confident is not a concept solely meant for male mastery, although again, I'm aware the show is likely designed to offer the hetero male perspective on topics. But even if that is the case, your dating courses on empowerment will likely still apply to just about everyone, regardless of the client's specific relationship interest. I love what the show is teaching, and I will definitely continue to be a regular listener because the subjects really do apply to all demographics and genders, but it would be nice and even likely bring larger client or consumer base to your products and programs if you eased up on addressing just men and heteronormativity, saying things like get the girl you want, and possibly decided to not be as gender specific in talks about the show and in your courses. I'm not saying to address women as well, I'm saying to address people. I doubt in this case the rate of your male listeners will decline because again, the show is great for everyone. Keep up the great work. The Art of Charm really does help my 23-year-old job hunting self walk out the door feeling a bit more peppy and confident. Thank you, Brooke. Brooke, first of all, thanks so much for the email. I really do appreciate it. We really appreciate it. But I'm gonna stand firm here. Honestly, I'm so glad that so many women listen to The Art of Charm. Straight women listen, queer women listen. That word is in itself is strange for me. But also, gay men listen, I'm sure. I know a lot of straight guys listen. That's our audience. Everybody's, of course, welcome to listen. Our programs, however, the live programs in Los Angeles are for men interested in meeting and attracting women and working on their business acumen and networking skills. Women are actually not allowed. We have a residential program. We don't cater to women there at all. We offer phone coaching for women and that's it. That said, we do explain things from a hetero normal, to use the word you want, or a hetero male perspective. That is exactly what the show is. That is exactly what I speak on I can't speak for everyone, and I feel like creating an audience that's more general will actually hurt what we're trying to do here. We love talking about masculinity. We love talking about being a better man. If a lot of that applies to you as a lesbian female, then that's awesome, but you are not my audience. You are welcome to be a part of it. However, you are not our core. So I will continue to address men, especially straight men who are interested in doing what we wanna do. Everybody else, love you guys. You're welcome to communicate. You're welcome to apply this. I'm glad that you do. I'm glad that you do share and that you do love the show, but we are going to stick to our core audience of heterosexual, you know, regular Joes just trying to level up. And uh, I'm not going to water that down because I don't think it's doing anybody a service. And something tells me you'll still be listening even if I say hey guys and not hey guys and girls. Thanks so much, Brooke. All right, now on to the show. We're talking with former underground bar fighter Jesse Elder. This is like Fight Club for real. Really interesting story here. What he learned about from nearly being killed in a fight and why we can't control our experience or the experiences of others, as well as separating the quote-unquote truth from what's useful and what actually works, as well as learning about money and money mindsets to go from broke to multimillionaire business owner, cultivating a real abundance mindset without going all woo-woo, and creating and cultivating a balanced life and lifestyle 
Jesse Elder. Enjoy. You've done martial arts schools. You you did like an underground bar fight thing, which sounds kind of like Fight Club, but way more dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, in chronological order, it started, you know, I was a kid taking martial arts, loved it, and was blessed to have a series of instructors that as soon as they had some help, they were more than happy to get out of the way. And that taught me a lot of lessons as an entrepreneur <laughs> later on. But uh, I was teaching when I was 15, and by the time I was 17, 18 years old, I was running all the classes and really got the bug for competition and just loved – I just loved how binary it was. You know, It wasn't like anybody's opinion. You either won or you didn't. And this is – you know, the UFC was gaining in popularity, and I was also a bouncer while I was teaching classes during the day at these after-school programs for karate. I was a bouncer to try and, and pay the bills because I was super, super broke. Uh, the club that I was working at started to have these fight nights on Thursday nights, and they'd roll out, literally would roll out like wrestling mats on the dance floor of this nightclub and have a sign-up sheet for anybody that wanted to come fight. And I thought, this is one of those experiences that I, I have a chance to look back on years from now, and I don't want to regret not having this life experience. So I signed up and walked into the ring not having any clue what to expect, ended up having two fights that night. Ended up winning both of them, and I was hooked. So that was kind of how the, the No Holds Barred uh, chapter came and went. Yeah, I ended so, up, so wait a minute. How is that legal again, or is it just they didn't give a shit? Ah, uh, legal, schmeagle, you right. know. Are you in Canada? <laughs> I feel like that would be legal in Canada because they're like, oh, it'll be fine. You yeah, know? up north when there's no other recreation, maybe so. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, it'll be fine. If someone beats you into oblivion, they're like, oh, I'm not going to sue them. I mean, you were there – of your own yeah. free will. And in America, they're like, I lost. I'm going to sue you because I, I'm embarrassed. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is that, I mean, there was literally no rules. So there's no time limit, no weight division. Um, some of the matches, they didn't even have safety gear. So it's just bare knuckle. And it was an adventure. It was an adventure for sure. It seems legit. And so I got to ask, did you lose ever? Because if you lost, I mean, that must have been pretty bad getting bare knuckle beat down. Yeah, I had there's two really good losses that I had. One was um, to a, a legitimate submission. I mean, the guy got me in a, in a pretty good heel hook and uh, and ripped my leg pretty good and, and totally fair and square. I mean, he he was definitely the better man that night. And then uh, another one is uh, definitely memorable. I'd fought all summer long and ended up winning. You know, pretty much every week I was fighting and I kept winning. I ended up in the ring with this dude who. There was no weight classes, but he was about 40, 45 pounds heavier, <laughs> and his corner had been watching me fight all summer, and they knew that I had better ground skills than he did. And so we go, we touch gloves, and I'm already knowing my strategy. I'm going to take him down, get him on the ground, neutralize his you know, the, the size advantage, and position him for a sub or, or a submission. So we go and we're circling and there's like hundreds of people in the place because this was like the big matchup. You know, the club owners thrilled because drink specials are going like crazy. Um, I had a ton of people there. My students, my family came out to watch and uh, it was just uh, incredible. The energy was like insane. So we go, we're circling and here comes that bomb that he throws, which I was waiting for. I shoot in, get in close, clinch. I couldn't take him down. Like I, no matter what I did, I, I couldn't get the leverage. And, and I realized why it was because his corner had covered him in Vaseline. Oh shit. So his whole body was greased up. Let's just say that that threw my game off. Yeah. Damn. I spent, I spent three rounds uh, just of trying the best I could to keep taking him down, kept getting more and more tired, kept taking shots every time I'd fail a takedown and at the end of the match. Um, you know, it was three, five minute rounds. And at, at the end I was spent, he won. And I told my corner, I said, I, I need to, uh, I need you to go get me checked out. And I said, it's something's wrong. Cause I can't breathe properly. I feel like I'm sipping air through a coffee stirrer. You know, I can't breathe. So they took me to the hospital and dude, it was like, it was a pivotal moment in my life. And I look back on that night, probably a thousand times and, and just gone back to, that experience and really pulled a lot of lessons from it. And I, I mean, I can say without, without hoopla, without trying to be dramatic that my life totally fucking changed that night because I'm laying in the hospital bed. Uh, the doctor comes in. He says, the reason you can't breathe properly, Mr. Elder is because, you know, your nose has moved over uh, an inch to the wrong direction. <laughs> 
when it's your nose, any direction is the wrong direction. <laughs> I don't know exactly. if they told you that. <laughs> exactly. He says your nose is messed up. You've got a concussion. But the reason you're having a hard time breathing is because your left lung is collapsed. You know, it's registering sort of. Um, I didn't have any reference for that. He walks out and I'm just sitting there and in this crazy pain. Uh, but that wasn't the worst part. I mean, it, the physical pain wasn't the worst part of it. The worst part was knowing that my family and my students and everybody came out there to see this. And instead that what they saw was me, you know, trying to negotiate this greased up fighter. And they basically watched me get my ass beat for three rounds. I mean, I'm feeling like a total fucking failure. I mean, right. I'm just like totally, totally, totally beaten physically, mentally, emotionally beaten. And I'm like, I'm trying to reconcile that. I mean, I'm coming off of nine wins. I'm supposedly, you know, the golden guy that you know everybody came out to see win. And, and instead, the exact opposite thing happened. So I'm in the hospital bed. I'm by myself. I can see through the swinging doors, like my family. I mean, my parents had come out to watch me fight, my students, and they were just all sick to their stomach over what happened. And a couple of really interesting distinctions developed. And one is that I realized that I can't control their experience. And they're having their experience, which is certainly connected to my experience, but it's still their experience. It's an independent sensation that they're having. And I realized that they get to have their experience. And there's nothing in that moment that I could do about it. So there's a real kind of an interesting freedom there uh, when I realized that it, I can't control what it is that they're feeling, that only they can. So in the meantime, let me focus on me. You know, what the hell is going on with me? And I ask myself, like literally in the hospital bed, I ask myself, how am I doing? And I got back the weirdest answer. And I have no idea where this answer came from. Um, you know, I, I wasn't a particularly spiritual guy. Um, you know, I, I paid attention. And I, I'd done some reading. But the answer I get back is I'm fine. Jordan, it struck me, dude. I was laying there in this agony and I'm asking, how am I doing? And the answer I get back is I'm fine. And I'm like, well, that's weird. If, if I'm fine, well, who is the I that got his ass beat? And who's the I that's fine? And like in that moment, it was one of those matrix moments where I realized that, you know, I've identified myself for 21, 22 years at that point. I'd identified myself as my body. And I realized in that moment in that hospital bed that I have a body, but I'm not my body, that I have – that whoever I am is this energy that animates that body. And the moment that I die, whenever that happens to be, that energy will withdraw, just like turning the light off. You know, you, you, The bulb weighs the same or the lamp weighs the same. It's just no longer animated by that electricity. And like I got it. Like my body is the same thing. So – my body can be totally beaten. It can be totally destroyed. But who I am has nothing to do with that. And I began to really think that through and know without question that that night was a total turning point in my life because I really lost a lot of fear that night. And I stopped worrying about superficial shit and I stopped worrying about what people thought about me. And I didn't give a fuck what other people thought about me, but I started caring a lot more about people because I guess I just started seeing them as, as extensions of that same energy. So I got my ass beat that night, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So you started seeing other people as almost like an extension of yourself. Yeah, it was weird. Like I started seeing it, like I'd have conversations with people and these conversations were super deep. People that I didn't even know. I mean, people I'd be taking the bus because I was still broke as shit, but I'd yeah. be talking to people on the bus and, and feeling like it was a soulmate and not like a weird sexual attraction. There's nothing like that. It was just like a human connection. I started to have that experience increasingly. And I just started seeing other people as much, much more similar than they were dissimilar. <laughs> a trippy experience. Yeah, like a near death type of realization. I guess so. I mean, I've heard, I've no, I mean, I've got plenty of friends of mine that have had a near death experience and, and, uh, you know, and other people that have had, you know, plenty of, I guess you'd say hallucinogenic experiences and you know, reality isn't all that it's cracked up to be. There's a whole lot more going on than our senses tell us. Yeah, that's amazing. And so you went from broke that you didn't stay broke long. You started a business that started to crush it. Was that as a result of some of the things that you'd learned and the way that you started to see the world? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfectly said because that I came out of that and that was like summer. I taught a little more, 
over the next year or so. And then I opened my school yeah, about a year after that. I just reached the point where it was like, fuck it. It's never going to be perfect. I'm never going to have all the answers, and I don't want all the answers because that would be boring as shit. So I just want to put my best foot forward, go all in, and worst thing that's going to happen is I'm going to learn something so that I can move forward. And the best thing that will happen is I actually get my outcome. <laughs> it is totally learning on the fly. I actually ended up taking over a location uh, that was run by another instructor in town who had – we ended up fighting because it, it just uh, – I ended up fighting him. I beat him, and he ended up respecting the fight, and I ended up giving me keys to his location, essentially. And that Wait, location, so you had like a legit kung fu breakdown where you were like, I challenge you, and like the other guy's like, oh, I would respect your challenge, and then you duked it out and had a duel, and then he lost, so he was like, you are, you are superior, and gave you the keys to his dojo. This is, that happened? Yeah, minus the accents. That's pretty much what happened. Unbelievable. That is yeah. so insane. That is insanity. Well, let's let, we'll jump on that. I the the club that I bounced at, a uh, good friend of mine Lou was a bar back and he was just a total enthusiast. He came out to watch all my fights. We were really good friends. And I was completely infatuated with jujitsu because really not a lot of guys were doing it in these fights. And I was taking every opportunity to go and study and learn. And I would get off of work and drive up to Dallas and do a seminar you know, with Hoist Gracie back in the day. And so that was actually a really early experience for me of the power of self-education because, you know, 300 bucks on a seminar and I'd come back and I'd win a couple hundred bucks and get my money back. So you know, it's kind of a, a interesting time, but I was talking to Lou and he said, Hey, I know you really like jujitsu, but you know, my girlfriend takes classes with this other guy in town. And he said that jujitsu is a bunch of shit and it doesn't work. And I remember clearly my response and Lou and I have had lots of conversations about that since then. And I said, that's cool. It's not for everybody. He's entitled to his opinion. I'm entitled to mine. You know, I, I like it. So I'm going to keep doing it. Well, Lou passed that on to his girlfriend who passed it on to her instructor. And by the time it got to her instructor, it was something like, hey, my boyfriend's buddy who's a bouncer says that jujitsu will whip anybody. <laughs> yeah. And so that back and forth happened a couple of times. And finally, it got back to me that the guy had said that if I wanted to fight him, he'd fight me. And at that time, I thought, you know what? This is just the phase of my life that I'm in right now, I guess. So you tell me when and where. So the guy actually said, well, come to my school and you know, we'll find out. So uh, it was really interesting because the night that I took off, uh, I took off work as a bouncer to go and answer this challenge. It was really interesting because every other bouncer took off work that night as well. And so they all came out to watch this, whatever was going to happen, happen. A friend of mine from Austin at that time came down to San Antonio where all this was happening. So like eight of us walk into this guy's school and he's teaching class and he's you know, kind of pontificating about the dynamics of the angle and all this kind of stuff. And the guy was a legitimately good martial artist, but he was a shitty fighter. And that's just like so common. You know, there's so many people and not just martial arts. It's like life, man. There's people who are classically trained and they're academically you know, gifted and talented, whatever. And they're like the dumbest people you'll ever meet. They have like zero street smarts. Yeah. You know, it's like the consultant who, you know, the joke in, in coaching is that, you know, a consultant, a management consultant is like somebody who knows, you know, 58 ways to make love, but can't get a date on Friday. Yeah. So that's so true. That it's is crazy. the same for my industry, by the way. Oh man, it's rampant. I think it's just like human condition. People just bullshit themselves and they're just like, Oh, I'm have this many letters after my name or whatever. But so this guy's in his class and he's going on about the techniques and nobody will ever be able to take you down if you do this, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, does anybody have any questions? And all my buddies point at me standing in the corner and like, he's got a question. And I just raised my hand and said, yeah, I guess my question is what if somebody takes you to the ground they mount you. They're on top of you. They start punching you in the face, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's my question. And he said, well, it's very hard to take somebody to the ground if they know how to defend and blah, blah, blah. And he starts going through all these other you know, really technically complex movements, which is cool. Like if you're fighting somebody in a chat room, you'd beat the shit out of them. Yeah. But when you introduce physics and emotion, it's like a fucking hurricane. It just it is not going to be the same. So I said, that's cool. That's a great answer, but you didn't answer my question. My question is, what if somebody takes you down, is mounted on top of you, punching you in the face, and there's nothing you can do? What do you do then? And he looked at me. He says, well, does anybody want to try? And again, all my buddies point at me. So I go out on the mat, and we go at it. 
And a few seconds later, I've got him in a choke. He's tapping out. He says, well, anybody can, can do that one time. And I said, I'll do it as many times as you like. Let's go again. So we go again. I tapped him out again. And it, it was just one of those. I don't think I would respond this. I certainly wouldn't respond the same way today, but it was one of those moments in time where, you know what, this is just what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that he said anybody can do that one time because as far as I know, after you get choked out and you die, they don't have to do that again if they want to kill you. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. That's true. Exactly. Hey guys, I want to take a quick break for a second here. You've heard me talk a lot about taking you to the next level in life, at work, and in your relationships, and you've probably also thought to yourself, yeah, I wanna up my game, I wanna become a better man, a better boyfriend or husband, and a better person. And my guess is that you've been thinking about this for a long time, am I right? Well, I'm here to tell you this, stop thinking. Your chance is now. Do you really need more time, more information, and more plans for the future, or do you wanna become that guy today? Because the truth is this, You can be the guy who sits around and thinks about becoming better, and there's plenty of those guys out there, or you can be the guy who decides that today is the day you're gonna do something amazing, and I want that for you. Why? Because you've already got what it takes. The potential is there, even if you don't know it yet. Join me and thousands of other guys who've taken action in their lives at The Art of Charm. Call or email us, and we'll see if The Art of Charm can help you with your personal, relationship, and business challenges. All right, back to the show. Wow, and yeah, I used to take martial arts, and I was like, there were these yeah. guys who were like, no, I know praying mantis stance, and I would be like, what if you get kicked in the nuts? And yeah. they're like, well, I, that won't happen because it of my lightning happen. reflexes. I'm like, whatever, you've never been kicked in the nuts, obviously, you know? Yeah, exactly, I mean, all bets are off when reality hits. So, <laughs> yeah, anybody who's ever tried any ineffective shit and got their ass beat as a result. They're not as committed to bullshit anymore. Yeah, it's funny. The reason I stopped taking the stand-up Okinawan karate that I was taking was because I worked as a bouncer for four years shortly (sighs) after. That's And it's funny, we have that in common because honestly, nothing will get you out of a bullshit martial art faster than going and watching people get their asses kicked or having to throw people out that are bigger than you or choke no people doubt. out that's bigger than you. Because you're no like, doubt. I'm going to get into fighting stance. And the guy's like, I'm going to hit you in the, <laughs> with a bottle in the face. And you're like, oh, shit, I didn't train for that one. That was not on my green belt test. I, I missed that day. <laughs> yeah. you know, And it's like, oh, there's a guy who's 300 pounds and he's six foot six. You need to make sure he's downstairs and out the front door before he hurts somebody. And I'm like, I don't know if you got the memo or if you are blinder than a bat, but I am a <laughs> five foot nine white guy and I weigh about 160 pounds back then. You know, I wish I weighed that now. And and it's <laughs> like, uh, I might need help. Like, can we have six or seven guys up here to help me get rid of this guy? And, you know, you don't always have that luxury. You know, if you're by yourself and somebody's acting up and throwing bottles at girls or something, you've got to yeah. make sure that he slips and falls down the stairs because that's yeah, what small yeah. people do when they right, got to get rid right. of big people. You got physics on your side. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> that's crazy. Know, yeah, a long time ago, you know, past life type thing. I was sure I'm 34 now. I probably stopped probably by the time I was old enough to drink. I was about wrapping that up, you know. But yeah, it's funny because I saw tons of those guys that were like, oh, you know, that would never happen and blah, blah, blah. And then it was like the FBI said 98% of fights in the street end up on the ground. And then there was the jiu-jitsu guys like, see, we knew that. And then the, the karate guys are like, what happens if you get attacked by multiple opponents? Then you're in trouble, you know? It's just like back and forth, but it was right. all intellectual right. debate. And it was like, go ahead and fight each other in groups and see who's left at the end. That's the only yeah. answer to that question. Yeah, you know? and then, and that's life. You know, for guys listening or for anybody listening to this, I mean, Jordan and I, you and I can rap all day about like the physics and the mechanics and the psychology and we can geek out about that shit. But it's like there are lessons in this shit. Like there are just pay attention to what works in any area of your life. You know, everything that I teach now, you know, online courses, live trainings, whatever, there's so much argument in the world about what's true. Well, this is the true way. This is the true way to market. This is the true way to get a girl's number. This is the true way to worship God. There's so many true ways. My position is I'm much less concerned with what's true than what's useful. And to me, that's yes. the acid test. I don't give a shit if it's true or not. Is it useful? Does it produce measurable, tangible, beneficial results? 
If it doesn't, fuck it, get it out. And if it does, keep doing it until something better comes along. Excellent. So what are you teaching now? What are you teaching men now or people now? Yeah, um, it's been a totally organic process, man. I, you know, after I did those fights, I opened that school and I didn't know anything about marketing or selling. I just knew how to train and teach and I loved it. And I loved seeing the transformation happen for people. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew that martial arts was a vehicle for this. And that was what we built our school on. You know, we didn't build our school based on who was, you know, the baddest fighter and all that stuff. We built it based on life skills and we built it based on helping people to get from wherever they are in their life to wherever they want to be and giving them tools to upgrade their confidence and upgrade their perspective on life. And it started affecting everything, their relationships and their physical health and their income. And you know, we had really just awesome people. And I reached a point where I taught about almost 18,000 classes in physical training and sales and marketing training for our staff. And I reached a point a couple of years ago where I was literally in the desert at Burning Man. And I had this like total epiphany. I'm laying on my back. The sun is shining. The sky's blue. And I realized I was done. You know, we built that one school up to eight schools. We had a consulting company that was attached to that. So we were teaching other people in the industry. And I just realized I was done. And I just wanted to just work with people outside of the, not confines, because it's an incredible vehicle, but I just was done with martial arts in that capacity. So I sold my schools to a partner and just began coaching. And I started coaching friends of mine who are entrepreneurs. And then that developed into one day I just grabbed my phone and I shot a video, put it on Facebook. The, the video was called 70 Seconds to Self Mastery. And I just shot it, forgot about it, just felt good to share and I, I opened my browser the next morning and it's got like 250 shares and people loved it. And I had like, there was more shares than I had friends. I mean, I just, I wasn't a big Facebook person, but people really resonated with the message. And I realized that, holy shit, like this is, this is the time, you know, now is the time to go with this. And it's not about business. It's not about whether or not you're an entrepreneur or you're, you've already got a six figure a month business, which is who I'd been coaching. This is about people. This is about human factor. And it's about people upgrading their life. That's what ended up developing. I developed an, an online course, promoted it through Facebook. We had 55 people sign up through private messages, like terrible funnel system, no opt-in. It was terrible. Like, by the way, if you're coaching people on business, I hope you've improved that aspect of your business by now, because that's the worst way to sell anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. It was, it was totally, totally like grassroots. Like I was PMing people at like four o'clock in the morning, like, oh, I can't wait to teach you. It's going to be awesome. And then I finished it. I look back. I'm like, you know, there's probably a better way to yes, do this. There are, but you know, it reminds me of the art of charm, humble beginnings, right? Like guys writing in and going, "Hey, can you help me with this?" And me being like, "Yeah, uh, I guess. Uh, you know, you should pay me though. Do you want to mail a check or you want to like PayPal me some money?" <laughs> and they'd be like, "Oh, let me get back to you." And then a month later, they're like, "Yeah, I guess I'll write you a check." And then they'd mail yeah. it, and it would take three weeks to get there, you know, from the other side of the world or something or the other side so of the country. So funny. And I'd go and cash it, and then I'd get on the phone with them and. Yeah, we should probably systemize this. And <laughs> even when we started our boot camp seven years ago, we had guys would come in and be like, hey, and we'd be like, oh, we totally didn't know that guy was coming. And and guys would show up and be like, hey, I'm Curtis from Canada. And we're like, oh, shit, Curtis from Canada's <laughs> here, guys. And then he's like, you didn't really know I was coming, did you? And we're like. Of course we of course did. We you're, by the way, you're the only student for boot camp this week. And he's like, I'm only here for the weekend. And we're like, yeah, that's what I meant. You know, and it's like, whatever. It, <laughs> Private it, lessons. Yeah. And now, of course, seven years later, we've got like an actual school and a training facility and everything is systemized. And looking back on that, I'm like, how dumb were we? But it is funny. You get excited about the idea and the execution of it. You know, you don't plan for the little logistical things because they're not as fun and you don't really know what the hell you're doing and right. eventually you figure it out. So what's some of the things that you're teaching? I mean, what are you teaching guys? Do you have a money habit or, or something that changed in your mind? Because when you're broke, it's not necessarily just because you're not earning enough money. A lot of times there's a mindset issue there. And then when you get a lot of money, I know a lot of people that make millions of dollars that are still broke because they're totally ridiculous with their finances and they can't, right. they can't, they could buy a Ferrari uh, in cash one day, and then the next day they're going, "Hey man, you have any gas money? I can't put any. Right. They can't put any money in their Ferrari. Yeah, you know? they don't have any yeah. money. Yeah. So did something totally. shift in your head that let you go from total dimwit with dough 
to, oh, now I'm a multimillionaire business guy and I got to kind of keep my shit together. Yeah, well, it was there was a series of really pivotal moments. And the first one was after I got the keys to this school and I realized that, you know, I've got this whatever $2,000 a month rent. And at the time, I think I was making about $800 a month through private lessons and, you know, people that I signed up. And so I had to level up and I realized that nobody gave a shit how good I was at martial arts or teaching. And I had to really start to learn people's language and I had to learn to solve problems through martial arts, not just deliver what I thought was, you know, the awesome part. And so I had to learn marketing and selling really, really quickly. I went to a small business administration workshop in the morning in San Antonio, and I walked out after 40 minutes. It was the most boring fucking thing I'd ever been to. And I thought, if this is what it means to be in business, I want no part of it. I will either go out of business and that's cool, or I'll figure this shit out on my own. Looking back, it was a stupid way to do it. There's plenty of resources in the industry, plenty of mentors. And I was lucky enough to kind of stumble on some people who said, hey, you know, you should probably do it this way. This is how you answer the phone. This is how you greet people when they're coming in. And so I was lucky to have a couple of mentors. And at the time, you know, growing up without very much money, a lot of love and a lot of support, but not very much money. That was something that was really important to me or thought it was. And uh, so I set a target that I'm going to make $100,000 a year. It took about two, two and a half years after I opened the school, but I just, I didn't have a plan B. I didn't have a, anything else to distract me and I wasn't dating anybody. I didn't really have any social life, really. It was just total immersion in the business and I just wanted to make as many mistakes as possible. And, you know, a couple of years later, the school was doing really well and I was doing $100,000 a year in the business. And then I, shortly after that, I was able to net that much and keep it. And then we set the target to do 100,000 in a quarter. Then we hit that. And then it was 100,000 a month. And when I sold the schools, we were on the way to doing 100,000 a week. And, you know, that 100,000 number was always kind of magical. But it, if there's one breakthrough, it's that I just started tracking what was important to me. And this is the core part of what I teach now, whether it's in relationships or whether it's health or whether it's meditation or whether it's money. There's uh, something called Pearson's Law, and Pearson's Law states that which is measured improves. That which is measured and recorded improves exponentially. So my staff and I just started just getting absolutely religious about where we we're at for the day and setting these daily targets and you know, just with an understanding that the money's there. It's not a question of is there enough money. It's not – a question of that. The question is, you now the money is just in the wrong account. It's in the account of the people that we haven't served yet. And the only reason it's still in their account and not in ours is because we haven't demonstrated our value. We haven't proven ourselves. And until we prove that the best use of that money is to invest in themselves and what we have to offer, we don't deserve the money in the first place. So let's go out there and start proving it. And that was really our culture. Excellent. That makes a lot of sense. And it's very positive as well. Instead of like, an adversarial relationship and things like that, that a lot of new business guys have, especially as well. Yeah. So, and that's a scarcity based mindset. And, and really, I mean, that th same thing translates to guys who, you know, trying to understand women or trying to understand relationships. And I just took the same approach when I found myself single after 11 years of marriage. And I realized that I'd never really had, um, I never dated, like I never really went out very much. You know, I was super shy as a teenager um, got a lot of recognition as a fighter and as a teacher, but socially I was completely awkward and I got married into a wonderful woman. And then after you know, 11 years, it wasn't as wonderful anymore. I realized that there were some fundamental things that, that I wasn't paying attention to, wasn't looking at, and we just, just decided to part ways. And I found myself single with all of this skill set of communicating to people and build, building value-based relationships. And all of a sudden, you know, you wake up and you, you're like, you remember Spider-Man when you know he woke up after being bitten by the spider? Yeah, and he's like no longer a skinny, weak nerd, and he's looking yeah. at himself in the mirror, yeah. That's how I felt. It was like, holy shit, like I just love people in general. And I started to have conversations with women that were extremely candid, that were completely authentic, and I would just approach a woman – and I would say, hey, I'm Jesse. What's your name? And we'd start talking. And if it seemed like there was some chemistry or some attraction, I would simply say, here's the deal. Like I, I came up to talk to you because you look like an interesting person and, and I'd like to see the world through your eyes for a little while. Um, that being said, I like me plenty. So whether you also like me or not is not that important to me. Right, right. 
and it really just became this totally merit based approach. And, you know, I ended up meeting a lot of just amazing women and having some fantastic connections. And, you know, in some cases, introducing them to friends of mine who were more of what they were actually looking for. Sure. And there's just no need to play games. You know, that this whole, you know, battle of the sexes is totally false. It's completely fabricated. There's no need to battle. Let's take a quick time out for a sec. Some people think the Art of Charm live training programs are just about picking up girls. And honestly, there's some of that. One week with us and you'll be rocking out in that department, I promise. But as a guy, I know how important it is to be awesome and well-rounded. And not just awesome with girls. You gotta be awesome at work, awesome at home, and awesome with your friends and family. Guys, we need to step it up everywhere. And that's why we call our company the Art of Charm. That special something that gets you results wherever you go. And trust me, the results are real. Every day I get new emails and calls from the guys who've decided to take our live training programs, and what I hear is simply amazing. Just weeks after graduating, they land a promotion, they form a new wolf pack, and they start a new business, or find a partner. They have a new life, and it's not an accident. Call or email us, and we'll see what the Art of Charm live training programs can do for you. Now, back to the good stuff. Yeah, and it sounds like you went from the battling for essentially that scarcity mindset to basically self-realization, of course, when you almost died slash got your butt kicked, and a sort of natural abundance that actually exists. And it took me a long time to realize this as well. And it's all I feel like I'm always peeling layers off of that too, where I'm like, oh, I got to hustle and get that money. And then it's like, oh, there's plenty of that. Got to go out there yeah. and hustle and get those girls. Oh, there's a lot of great women out there. And now that I have my other shit together, it's not that hard to be around them and and become, you know, get into relationships with great people. Oh, you know, I want to hang out with all the cool people. There's so much going on. It doesn't matter. You're not going to miss anything. You know, right. it's just one thing after the other after the other. And it's helped me become a lot less competitive in areas where it doesn't matter and have a lot more fun and realize there's just like, like you and I were saying before offline, there's more money, sex, power, and positivity and influence, positive influence when guys start to get this, but it is tricky. Some of us have to be beaten within inches of our lives to get there. <laughs> Other guys have to work for 10 years to get there. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. something most people wake up a la Spider-Man and realize. Well, you, you just put it perfectly. There is plenty. You know, if we can just accept that and we can just, even if you don't accept it, if you can just suspend your disbelief long enough to try that on for size, I mean, the culture in society just does terrible things to women, but it does, it fucks guys over too. And, you know, men and women end up responding to society's narrative instead of who they are authentically. And the cool part though, is it only takes one person. It only takes one conscious person in the entire bar or the entire restaurant or the entire club or whatever. It only takes one conscious person to relate to people authentically for them to really get it. And it's man, that's a beautiful gift that you actually give, can give people. I think the thing that's important, and uh, this stuff matters because everything you need is already in you. And there's a lot of people out there that think, I need more resources or I need things to add on to my personality. And that's why we say at The Art of Charm that this is all a subtractive process. So it's not Beautiful. about it's not about adding a cool guy persona on and adding cool guy clothes and adding muscles so you look you know, strong and tough and adding on cool tats if they're not part of who you actually are and, you know, doing weird things with your hair and getting lots of joy. It's about taking away insecurity, taking away doubt and, and self-doubt especially and taking away bad belief systems that aren't serving you that you've had for 20 years because of something that literally happened in high school or even earlier. And a lot of people are laughing right now, but it's true. You can get rejected or embarrassed by a girl in third grade. And when you're 30, it, it's still fucking with your mojo. Yeah. Yeah. It will. If you let it, there's no question. I'm like sitting here on the phone and I'm just like nodding my head like, yes, yes, yes. Everything you just said, because it is a subtractive process. And the hardest part is knowing how easy it actually is. And I know that sounds like Zen as fuck, but it really isn't hard. What's hard is pretending to be something that you're not. What's hard is having people accept that facade and having to keep it up because if you start showing who you really are, they might not like you because that's not who they really know. So it takes balls, man. It takes courage, genuine courage to say, hey, this is me. 
and I like me plenty. So whether you also like me or not is not that important to me. And this is what I found, and I'm sure that you found the exact same thing in your experience, is that when you can completely and totally 100% accept yourself, when you can accept yourself as you are, who you are right now, and you can accept that unconditionally, then that's actually the foundation for self-love. If you can accept yourself as you are, then you can begin to love yourself as you are. And when we can love ourselves as we are, then it opens up this incredible space for something that, that I would call need-free connection. Well, we, we can connect with people in a way that we have zero need to manipulate them, and we are completely immune to any attempt for, for someone to try and manipulate us. Yes, yes. I agree, and I think that's a huge element of the differences between – a man and merely an adult human male. Damn, dude, I just said that same thing this last week in a training. Dude, that's uncanny. I agree a thousand percent. Women will say, what's up with all these man boys? And you'll look around and you'll go, this guy's a man child. And you yeah. know, it's really, man child is, is funny, but actually this person it's is true. an adult human male and is not a man. There's neediness there, there's baggage there that's causing this person to need to manipulate others, to be manipulated by others, and it's just, it's really unmanly. And I don't it's mean that in like the totally. chest beating sense, you know what I mean? I mean yeah. in like the agenda having guy who, who wants things to go his way and is like manipulating people to get love and things like that. It's just so not masculine in the sort of woo-woo sense that we're talking right now. Yeah, I mean, dude, I agree. Um, completely like I'm just sitting here not in my head again like yes and if dudes can learn what it really means to be a man and what it really means to be to stop being a boy you know just because your balls drop and your voice deepens doesn't make you a man and just because you have been laid 10 or a dozen or one or a hundred or a thousand times that putting your penis in a girl's vagina doesn't make you a man or how do we as men really maintain that manhood you know, that's what your entire beingness is about is helping guys and, and everybody. I mean, a, a woman listening to this is going to learn so much about guys, but she's also yes. going to learn about what it means to be human because that's what you've done. You've elevated the conversation completely above the level of how do I get the girl's number? How do I get laid? How do I, you know, kill my hangover the next morning? How do I beat a traffic ticket? Blah, blah, blah. And there's a shitload of that stuff out there. And then, you know, maybe there's time and a place for everything, but you've elevated the whole conversation. And from my perspective, Jordan, just like just to reflect back to you, my experience of you just on this call, like you give people back to themselves. That's awesome. I love that. That's what happens. People see their authentic self reflected in your language. And that's a fucking gift, man. You, you have a gift with that for sure. I appreciate that. I appreciate you as well. Is there some concept that you want to hit on or rap with or something like that? You know, we've touched on a lot of things, and I'm, I'm sure this is – people are going to want to go back and refer to because there was a lot of data points and a lot of nuggets. I do share a concept which is super accessible for people, uh, but it just reinforces kind of everything that we're talking about. So we'll kind of encapsulate the conversation in this. I teach a concept called the triad, and the triad is if you imagine a triangle, and at the top of the triangle, you have physicality. And by physicality, that means your your physical body. You know, your, your health and your vitality. It also means your physical environment. So the home that you live in, the, the space that you occupy, the vehicle or vehicles that you have, if you have them, your clothes, your appearance, that's all at the top part of the triad. That's your physicality. The bottom right hand side, when we're doing this live, we draw a heart and that's your connection with other human beings that you share this planet with. And that may be a significant other, if that's a space you're in, you know, maybe one lover that you are just completely focusing your energy on. It, it may be a lot of lovers, but it doesn't just have to do with intimate relationships. It's also your family, which is a different kind of intimacy. And it's your friends and it's your employer or your employees. It's your customers, clients, all the people that you come into contact with. That's the second part of the triad. And that's a, an equally important part of your life. And then over on the left-hand lower part of the triad, draw a dollar sign. 
Uh, although I did have a guy in a training who drew, uh, you know, the Bitcoin logo. So oh, that's what, funny. Yeah. whatever prosperity means to you financially, that's the third part. And then in the middle, I draw an infinity symbol, um, but I've had people draw a cross if they come from a Christian background. Or I've had people draw a Star of David. I've had people draw a crescent if they're of the Muslim faith. It's really just your connection with the infinite and whatever word and whatever symbol you want to use to describe your connection with infinite intelligence, that's cool. And there's not one better than the other. So if we look at this visual now and, you know, people can kind of, you know, construct this for themselves. At the top, you've got physicality. On the lower right-hand side, you've got your heart connections and your people. And on the lower left-hand side, you've got your money. And in the very center, you've got your connection with source energy, with God, with the universe. The main lesson is that these areas of your life are all completely connected. You experience abundance in one. You can experience abundance in all. And there's not one of these areas that's more important than all of them. And success in life comes from progressing in each of those areas simultaneously, not at the expense of another. And so you'll see this happen constantly where people will go into business, for example, make some money, chase the launch, chase the IPO, uh, just get started, you know, trying to hit their sales goals, but at the expense of their relationships or at the expense of their health or at the expense of their spirituality or whatever they call their connection to non-physical energy. And they justify it and society justifies it by saying, well, you know, he's a son of a bitch and he's broke and he's fat as shit. Um, but man, that guy knows how to make money and people justify it. And I'm here to say that's bullshit. If you're only experiencing abundance in one or two or even three areas when you could and should be experiencing it in all four simultaneously, if somebody settles for abundance in one or two areas, that's like giving God the finger. That's an interesting point. You know, you did touch upon one of my pet peeves and when an athlete or somebody or like a rapper will do something just awful and totally ridiculous that he should be put in jail for and people are like, oh, well, you know what? I mean, the dude is rich, so I don't care. I mean, even more reason for him to know better than to be a racist piece of shit or whatever it is yeah. you know, that happened. And it's just like, well, yeah, you know, he might be a total idiot on TV, but, you know, scoreboard, he's loaded. And I'm like, scoreboard what? That guy's a moron. Right. I don't care right. if he's got $10 billion. Right, right. So for me, it's just like, you are not just your bank account. You are not just your Facebook. I mean, imagine if, reverse that, take the money aspect out and put something else, how many Twitter followers you have or something. What if somebody like <laughs> right. somebody like rapes someone and they're like, I don't know though, he's got like 800,000 Twitter followers. So I know, scoreboard. like that justifies it. Unbelievable. And, there, and there's no reason not to have it all. There really isn't. Not in today's day and age where we know that it's bad for you to focus on one thing only. I mean, we know this. We can prove with science that stress and all these things will kill you and that you're not happier with a certain level of money after, what is it, like 68,000 bucks is like the top rung of happiness and everything after that's like a super tiny marginal increase in lifestyle. I mean, we know mm -hmm. these things, you know, and we see the science behind the studies and yet people will still do it. And I know that old habits die hard, but hopefully here we can sort of shed the light on that and, and help people think in a different way. Thank you very much yeah. for that. The feeling is totally mutual, man. And money just makes us more of who we are. And the more we have, the more we can, the more we can be and more choices we get. Well, thanks so much, Jesse Elder. People can find you at the show notes. We'll be linking up jessielder.com. Much appreciated, brother. Both ways, man. This has absolutely been a pleasure and can't wait to see your journey continue to unfold. You're helping a lot of people, man. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Really interesting underground bar fight type deal and almost dying in a fight, no thanks. I really liked separating the truth from what's useful and what actually works, not just in terms of martial arts, but doing this and applying this across our lives, especially in business, and learning about money and these money mindsets to go from how he went from broke to multimillionaire business owner. That's a mindset shift I think a lot of us need to make. It took me a long time to make these mindset shifts myself, as well as cultivating that real, legit abundance mindset without being super woo-woo about it, but actually having that and putting that into play in a very practical way and creating and cultivating that balanced life and lifestyle. More from Jesse at jessielder.com. Now let's wrap with a fashion tip from Aaron Marino. Due to popular demand, we got fashion tips from my man Aaron Marino from imalphaM.com. He's gonna be dropping some knowledge on us to learn how to dress our best. All right, so... I'm a noob to buying suits. A lot of people at AOC love buying suits. A lot of students ask me, 
hey, what kind of suit do I get? I'm the last guy to ask. And one of the things I noticed is there's two and three buttons and double-breasted, single-breasted. There's a million choices, but let's start with buttons. How many buttons? What's the trend in buttons right now? <laughs> two. Always go with two buttons. The idea is that the suit that you buy now needs to be stylish in three years, five years, six years from now. Uh, two button is standard. It's classic. You know, the trends, one button, three button, four button, five button, they were going crazy with buttons. You really want to just stick with the classics, okay? As far as lapels are concerned, go with the notch lapel. It's going to be the safest. You're going to be able to wear that suit now. You're going to be wear, wearing that suit in five years from now. Two buttons is is my standard rule. Excellent. And what about ticket pockets? Those are trendy ticket, too. Ticket pockets, another one of those trendy items. You know, it looks great now, but in three years from now, you're not going to be seeing it. So I would say go simple, go as standard, as classic as possible for that basic suit. If you're looking to, you know, get multiple suits and you want to do something a little bit trendier, then go for it. But as far as the basic rule and, and rule of thumb, go with two, simple, classic, you'll never go wrong with it. Excellent. For more from Aaron Marino, search for Alpha M on YouTube or go to imalphaM.com. Solid show as usual, if I do say so myself. Show feedback and guest suggestions. We rely on you guys to help keep our finger on the pulse. So if you know someone who's a good fit for the show, let us know at jordanh at theartofcharm.com. Boot camp details, that's our live training at theartofcharm.com. And that's also where you can find links to us on Twitter, Facebook, and other social media. If you're listening to this but you're not subscribed in iTunes or Stitcher, then that needs to change. Getting our shows delivered free to your phone or computer is the best way to make sure you don't miss anything. You can do that by going to iTunes and searching for the Art of Charm podcast or by going to theartofcharm.com slash iTunes and clicking subscribe. That's it. You guys can also help us if you subscribe in iTunes or Stitcher. Give us a five-star rating and write something nice. We'll love you forever. Just go to iTunes.com slash The Art of Charm and it'll take you right there. When you write us a review, it not only makes us feel proud, but it helps keep us in the ranks so that other people who can use this information can find the show more easily and get the credible advice that they need. It's also the best way to support the show other than purchasing training from us. So tell your friends because the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to someone else, either in person or shared on the web. So have a great week, go out there and get social and leave everything better than you found it. Thanks for listening to The Art of Charm. Get more confidence, relationship skills, life hacks, and everything for the extraordinary man at theartofcharmpodcast.com.